Yeah. So hello, uh, my name is Ezequiel Garcia. I work for Collabora as a kernel engineer, and I'm going to talk about video for Linux. So it's a completely different topic. So um, I was wondering if we could make a quick summary of the of the topic of the of the presentation. It's a lot of content. So since the talk begins with a question, right? It's only fair to start with an answer. So the question is. Um, is video for Linux ready for all cutting edge hardware, right? And so, no, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. Okay. I was, yeah, it was, it was just meant for you. You can pick the... Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Fabian. That's all you need to know, I guess. Um, I wasn't expecting so much laugh, anyway. Uh, so I guess you want a full story, so let's begin uh, with the agenda. I'm going to be talking about APIs mostly, not much about the implementation. Um, so it's all going to be about interfaces, interfaces and interfaces. Um, so I will begin with the traditional so-called video for Linux API, which is the thing we have been using so far, which is the thing, the thing I guess you all know. How, how many of you have worked with video for Linux? Yes, we all know and love this. Uh, so, first of all, uh, current video for Linux. I guess you all know the the bunny, the rabbit. Um, so, before Mark asks me about what happened with video for Linux two or something, um, there is no such thing as video for Linux one. So, when you see v 4 l two or video for Linux two being mentioned, it's actually the only video for Linux we have so far. So until there is a video for Linux 3, I'm going to just say video for Linux. And it's going to mean the only video for Linux, okay? So the video for Linux API, uh, it supports a wide range of different devices. Um, I'm going to be mostly talking about two of them on this talk. Uh, capture devices, which are probably the most popular of them or the most used ones. Um, such as cameras, web cameras, USB cameras. Uh, I have an example here. This is an analog, analog uh, video adapter, um, which you can use to to capture an analog video, such as you know NTSC, PAL, um, SECAM here in France, I think. Yeah. So this is actually the, the um, my first device driver here. So I'm. I'm uh, nostalgic about it. Anyway, um, so the API is quite simple. In fact, you have a bunch of IOCTLs there. Uh, of course, they work on a file descriptor, so you get poll, regular poll semantics. Um, you have, just to give you an example, right? Uh, IOCTLs to set the format, get the format, get the standard, set the standard, you know. Um, then you have a bunch of buffer related IOCTLs to request buffers from the kernel. Uh, then you can queue buffers, dequeue buffers, which basically means passing the ownership back and forth from, from the user to the kernel, and, and some more. And let's, took a, let's take a look at a simple sequence uh, between user space and kernel. Uh, you, would regular, you, you would typically first set the format, uh, set some, some, some controls, such as brightness, contrast, Whatever, this is going to be important later. Quite important, in fact. So uh, you could think, uh, those controls, you can think about it as metadata, right? Could be. And then it's a very simplified diagram, so it's not like it's going to work. Um, then you would, top, you would typically pass some buffers to the kernel. It would start the operation with uh, start or something. Um, eventually, you would receive uh, some some buffers back. You you would you would complete the, the, the DMA stuff, the, the DMA operation, and uh, you could you could then dequeue the buffers via a blocking dequeue call or via some poll or something. And that's it. That's pretty much all we have. Um, it's a very nice API. Everyone knows about this about this. Um, Probably thousands of vendors use this, uh, either directly or via some um, framework, you know, FFmpeg uh, or just Reamer, something like that. Um, 
for instance, just to give you an example, the, um, the biggest cloud surveillance video vendor in the world um, uses this uh, to drive their, their analog video, to get the analog video. Um, it is probably around 10,000 cameras or, or, or something, so we are all being watched, I guess. I am being watched, definitely. Um, so, Codex. Um, this is the thing we, we don't know, maybe, right? Uh, somebody asked me yesterday about uh, this being supported at all in the kernel. So, good news, it is supported. It is supported and it is being more supported uh, as, as, I, as, as, as we speak right now. So, good news. Uh, Codex are split in two types, maybe. maybe. Uh, the first type is the stateful type which means basically that all the state is kept in the hardware, right? The, the hardware keeps, keeps, keeps all the state there. And it, means, it basically means that the hardware will make all the, all the parsing of the, of the say, um, the H, H, H.264 or JPEG. Um, so the, the driver doesn't need to do that, and neither the user space. The, the user space will just pass some buffers and the kernel will just pass those buffers to the hardware and the thing will just work. The difference with the regular captured devices is that now we have uh, two, two different endpoints. We have the input endpoint and then we have the output endpoint, right? Because we are pushing some, uh, for instance, JPEG, JPEG frames on, the, on one side and we are getting raw frames on the other side. Um, which, which means basically that all the, all the APIs that I have just shown, uh, the stream-based the stream API, are going to be duplicated on both, on both endpoints, okay? You will have to set the format on the input side, set the format on the output side. I guess this is super boring. It's super um, easy and boring, okay? Now, the quirk here is that we didn't have a specification in place. So, this is the... This is the bad news part. Uh, we didn't have a specification in place, so that means there was no standard on how drivers are, were, were supposed to behave, which is quite lame for us, to be honest. Um, there are some patches going on by guys from Google, uh, so we are finally discussing how the specification should look like. Uh, it should be merged really soon, in fact, this year, hopefully. Now, what does it mean? I mean we have a bunch of platforms with, set, with stateful codecs merged and working and being used by vendors, but with no standard. So guess what happened? I mean, the drivers aren't really compatible uh, between each other. So that means uh, they do slightly different things. Um, maybe you're wondering what is the, spef what is the specification specifying if it's, if it's using the same stream-based API that we know. Um, well, it basically specifies some special things on how should the formats negotiate uh, when you pass the first, uh, the, the, the first compressed frames, how does the driver detect what is the format and how does information goes to user space so the user space does the right allocation on, on buffers and so on. It also specifies the drain sequence which is what you want to do when you pause the codec. Okay. But, so the bad news is that there's no spec. The good news is that um, it is supported. It is supported in mainline and you can use it via uh, GStream or whatever. It is quite new on that side, so you have to probably build latest kernels with latest GStreamer, but it is there. So, just to make it very, very clear how stateful codecs work, the JPEG frame is being passed completely to the kernel. The kernel is going to pass that frame untouched to the hardware, and the hardware does, does the parsing. So um, with an example of a JPEG decoder, um, JPEG, I don't know if you are familiar with JPEG, but there are some simple tables, uh, quantization and entropy tables. And so the hardware will do the parsing of that, and when, then we, it, it it will decode the buffer on the on the, the input side, and it then going to push it back to the user space output raw frames. That is my niece there eating an apple. Yeah. 
So, stateless codex. Now, we have stateful, of course we have stateless. Um, stateless means basically that the state is now not in the hardware. The hardware needs assistance from the processor. Uh, we might wonder why, basically because it's cheaper to build, I don't know. So the kernel doesn't want to do that because we don't want that policy thing, we only provide mechanism. And that means it, all, all the burden is now going to user space, poor user space. Um, so basically the, the device driver, or, or better, better to put it this way, the hardware is going to accelerate the encoding or the, or, or the decoding job. And in this case, the stream-based stream API is not really um, sufficient. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in one slide. Before I, 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 I talk about why the API is, isn't really working, I want to mention that the specification is now in progress, but this time um, we, are, we are still on time to um, not, not merge drivers with, without the spec in place. So we are now discussing the spec um, at the same time that the first device driver is being accepted. So it is going to the staging part of the kernel um, until we probably settle the spec which is good news, I guess. We won't see a proliferation of crap. So, request API is the name of the, of, the, of the new API, which is a little bit different, and it's based on the stream API. Uh, quickly, just to highlight the difference between stateful and stateless. Now, the, the user space is going to parse the, the frame, the full frame, is going to extract the headers from it, for instance, like I mentioned, the quantization and the entropy stuff and so on. It's going to pass that as metadata to kernel together with the, with the compressed frame. And kernel is going to somehow pass that to hardware and hardware will decode. How, we do, how do we do that? Okay, we have the stream API, right? We, we have to start somewhere. Uh, how about we put the, met the metadata, metadata in the controls, controls and the payload in the buffers. That can work maybe. The problem with that, I don't know if someone has an idea, but the problem with that is that there is no actual correlation, there is no synchronization between the controls there and, and, and the buffers being passed at some later point inside some queue. So there isn't any actual way to say, okay, I want this quantization table to go with this payload, right? So we need something a little bit more um, involved. And that something is the request API. And the request API is quite easy to, 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 to under, un, understand, I think. Uh, basically, you start with a, with, a, with a request. You put inside a control where you would put your metadata. When I say inside, it's, it's, it's not actually inside, but somehow you will tie the control to the request. Now you're putting a buffer also tied to the request, so now there is a, a synchronization between the buffer and the, and the control. So buffer and metadata are now synchronized, right? And eventually you pass that, uh, that full request to hardware and the hardware can make the, um, the decode operation and it all works. And that's it. So, back to request API. Um, just some information, the request API is about to be merged. Um, I, I think it's not really merged as of today, uh, but the pull request is already there and it's already settled the discussion, so we are just waiting for Mauro to agree, to, 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 to press the button. Um, it took four years of discussion. Uh, it started with Hans, Hans Verquil doing some work back in 2014, and then it has been switch, switching hands, in fact, which is quite quite interesting. Uh, I think Loren Pinchak took it, and then Sakari Ailus, I think. And then back to Hans Verkwil, with who, who made the last, uh, the last progress. So it was a large effort. Um, 
I think it's it's interesting from some point of view to to mention that it it somehow resembles the DRM Atomic API. So we, it's nice to see some patterns there. Uh, from an implementation point of view, it's also similar in that it has two different hooks. Uh, the Atomic API has a check hook and then uh, the actual um, the actual operation that goes to hardware. This is similar. There's first a validate and then the, the request actually goes to hardware. So nice patterns there. Okay. Um, have I been too fast maybe? I don't know. Any questions? Yeah, Mike. So, uh, Wait a second. We are waiting for the microphone to land on you. Sure. Oh, oh. Yeah. I, I, I haven't gone into my de much detail. There's plenty of documentation in the sources, of course. Yeah, so I was curious if we can have uh, multiple requests all sharing the same control and having a dedicated buffer per request. Again. So you'll have like multiple of these request envelopes, right? Uh, all of them will share the same CTRL object. And each of them will have their own dedicated buffer with data. Is yes. that possible? There is one buffer, one set of controls, one buffer just. just one okay, buffer. so, so I'm, I'm if, just the one control, if the control data are the same for multiple buffers, you need to duplicate them. I have no idea. I need you, we need to check into the implementation exactly. Okay. Thanks. I don't exactly remember how it's written. Thanks. Why? Why is that important? Oh, well, because you do not want to have a duplicate metadata, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're just pointers, probably. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. They're just pointers, and inside, inside the pointer, somehow there is a request uh, FD somehow, or ID, or something that points back to the to the request that that belongs to it, something like that. Yeah, this is all impl implemented on top of the memory to memory framework inside Vito for Linux. Um, it doesn't matter much. It's it's all implementation details. I didn't want to go there. Yeah, microphone. How, how can it deal with the fact that maybe different hardware will, will take different type of configuration data to, to, to encode or decode? Well, the, you mean the codecs per se? Mm, not the codec, but w with the same codec, do we yeah. always have the same yeah. input uh, data to the drivers? Well, in theory, if you are decoding JPEG, you want to have... I'm, I'm picking JPEG because it's the simple, simpler example that, that there is. Um, with JPEG, you only have uh, standard JPEG tables that are specified in the, in the JPEG standard. So you, you're going to pass that to, to the kernel as standard video for Linux controls that are specified and defined as, uh, as, 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 as racks. So you have the quantization, JPEG stuff, the entropy JPEG, and th that is that is standard. The same goes for more complicated codecs such as H.264. Uh, some drivers, some hardware will use a subset of the of the of of the fields of those tables. But the idea is that the 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 ABI, right, the user API, is compliant with uh, codec standards and as full as possible as to cover all possible hardware. Okay. Yeah, sure, should, should. Actually, I have uh, one more, is it okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, so how does it work with uh, H.264? Uh, because then you basically have a bit stream, right? And there are a couple of keyframes and then there are some couple of differential uh, motion vector, it's whatever. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure how that works exactly in detail. Uh, how does that work with the request API and the stateless uh, decoding? Is the user space responsible for chopping up the bit stream somehow? <laughs> right, right. Some people leaving. Um, yes, good question. I Sorry actually, for asking this. No, no, I actually forgot. I actually thought about mentioning this and, and forgot. So. Uh, yes, the hardware is completely stateless. Right. 
Well, assuming the hardware is completely stateless, because we are seeing some weird monsters in there that are half stateless, but oh, they keep track of something. Uh, we need to figure out that. But uh, let's say the hardware is com completely stateless. Um, it's all there in the headers, in the H.264 headers, so to speak. So you only have to, quote unquote, only, you have to parse the entire H.264 and you have to go feed that to the, to the hardware. And the information to, to, to reference frames and so on are, are in the headers. So you actually have to keep some buffers uh, referenced. You cannot send them back to user space and deallocate them before a few things happen and that's that's still like in progress I think how we keep track of that and so on I might be wrong but and so uh, since you mentioned user space there is a quirk here right I told you that request API is about to be merged I, um, which means these codecs are about to be supported which I guess you, would, you could think, oh, it's going to work. I'm going to be opening VLC, and I'm going to be watching some video on my mo mobile processor. OK, bad news. We need user space to do parsing. And that's non-trivial. So um, what are the options? Well, a library completely written from scratch, first option. A VA API, who, who, who knows VA API? Okay, someone. Um, yeah, there is something called VA API. It's an Intel, I think, standard. So we only have to write a VA API backend. And if the VA API is somehow suitable for video for Linux, um, it's going to work. But we have to write it, it's not there. So, uh, I mentioned the first driver. The first one is the one for all winner platforms for the Cidrus VPU. It, the work has been done by the Bootling guys via a Kickstarter campaign, which went really well. I, I, I guess you are familiar with that. Um, and they actually wrote a VA API backend for, for MPEG, at least, or H264. I don't know. Um, If we have VA API, we can then use uh, other stuff because other stuff are already written on top of VA API, such as FFmpeg, GStreamer, VLC, and so on, so on. Cody, I don't know. But maybe there is another option. Maybe VA API is not suitable. Maybe we need to come up with something else. Patches are welcome. Anyway. Okay. So, what does the future look? Uh, I'm going to be mentioning a few things, not the whole future, because I, I don't know about the future, unfortunately. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's because mostly there are many, many things that I'm not really an expert. So if you're wondering what happens with complex uh, cameras and sensors, I'm not going to be mentioning that. It's a, uh, there are some IPUs that are not supported in the in kernel, and, and it's also a, a huge uh, owing effort. What I'm going to be talking about is about fences. Um, it, they are not fences per se. It, maybe the name is wrong, but it, they are DMA fences. It's a new mechanism, well, relatively new mechanism. Uh, it's also called explicit synchronization. It's a work in progress. We have sent some patches. Then we, we realized the patches were far from, from being ready. We went back to the board. Um, now we are thinking about it. We really don't know how, how we're going to solve this. Um, it allows for very nice things, such as reducing latency a lot, reducing the number of buffers that you need to keep around for the whole pipeline to work. OK, a picture. So we wake up a little. Um, this is how the world works in a simplified manner without fences. So without fences, you basically have to send the buffer to video for Linux, and then eventually it will start capturing or decoding or whatever, and then you wait for the buffer, right? Uh, the DMA comes in with an interrupt. So we, we wake up the application. The application grabs the buffer, 
It grabs the ownership of the buffer only to pass it to DRM. This is a typical video for Linux to, to, to DRM pipeline, right? Uh, zero copy stuff on, on all. So then user space goes back to sleep, waiting for the page flip to happen, which means space. Up, up, up. Okay, again. Yeah, we, we send the buffer to the DRM, we send the page flip, the atomic comet. We wait for the VBLANC event to come, and then we have to sleep again, wait for that, we get the buffer, okay. And so the buffer goes uh, ping-ponging from, from video for Linux to DRM to the application. With Fences, the world is quite different. We first pass the buffer to video for Linux, and we ask video for Linux to give us a fence, which is kind of a, a handle so we can wait on it instead of doing it in, in in the, the user space. So now we have a handle, which is called a fence, and it is an out fence, because it's being pushed out of Video for Linux, and we are going to push it in DRM, together with the, with the atomic comet. So DRM is going to first wait for that fence, it's going to wait for the signal about the DMA operation being ready, being finished, and then it's going to do the wavelength, right? So. Um, user, space, user, space wi user space wise, the API is a little bit simpler now, and the buffers are now reduced. The number of buffers that you need to, to fill the pipeline and to achieve frame rate, full, full frame rate is now somehow reduced um, because the buffers are, are all the time uh, inside the kernel somehow, and the ownership is just passed through beautiful Linux and DRM. This is the idea. The idea. Um, okay. And the last thing I want to mention, which is a nice work in Herogress at the time, is asynchronous UVC. Um, this is not a new API, just an implementation thing. Uh, Will Deacon said that the concurrency was not the solution, it was the problem. And so in, this, is, this is one, of the, one of, the, of the examples, for instance. Uh, concurrency. We have more CPUs now, but our drivers are still single-threaded. So that means that even though we have the capability to deal with high-quality devices, um, pushing a lot of data through buses that, 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 that have the power to drive all the data, now the driver is written with a single-thread um, implementation, and so they interrupt handles the packets and all the all the packets are uh, are are worked through in in the same handler in the same top half top half handler and that doesn't work simply so this is how it worked before asynchronous uvc this is how it would work before asynchronous uvc if we get to merge it uh, basically the uvc video complete is the, um, the top half, the IRQ, I, the, the interrupt handler. And the stream decode function does the, the copy payload. It does a memory copy. Yeah, it has to copy stuff around. Which is problematic for other reasons, because we, you, you have, doesn't matter, but it is quite slow, that, that part. And so after, after UVC, it's quite simple. You only have to do some header work and then you, you launch a different context and you do the same, you, you, you do the rest uh, in parallel with a bunch of CPUs. Okay, that's it. Okay, now it, now it worked. I love computers. <laughs> yes, this is, Random processes. Uh, sorry if that wo went too far, too, too quickly. I was counting with more questions from you, Mark. <laughs> questions allowed. Not from, oh, yeah. Well, uh, anyways. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about uh, stateless encoding into H.264? Because eventually you're feeding it full frames, basically, the, the encoder, right? 
but out of it is coming something which has the iframes or keyframes or whatever, and then the smaller frames which follow the keyframe, right? So how does that look uh, from the user space perspective? How does what look? Um, uh, when when the stateless encoder gives you frames which are which have different properties, different sizes, is this handled somehow? Or does the encoder only give you like the base 10 or 10 base You mean format? in terms of size and allocation? Yeah, in terms of size and, and properties of those frames. Um, I haven't looked at the Nitro 264 encoder in detail yet. Uh, I'm working on that, but... Okay. But, 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 but for JPEG, for instance, for a JPEG encoder, it's the same thing. You will get an, an, unknown, an unknown buffer size. Uh, that's true. Right. Yeah. You simply allocate the, the maximum. Yeah, okay, but the, the with, the, with the H.264, you will get also different frame yeah. properties, right? Yeah. And that's handled. Oh? That is already handled. I didn't understand. Uh, is that handled by the kernel already? That's like flagging the buffers with different flags? No, no, no. When, when, you, when you do the format nego negotiation, the kernel will tell you, you have to give me a buffer this size. And it will give you probably the maximum size for H.264. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Bert? Um, it's not clear to me. The request API is, is really supposed to deprecate the older API, or is that dependent on it? I, it's not really clear to me. Yeah. So re request API is built on top of the stream-based API. So it, it actually reuses the same IOCTLs. Uh, you, can, you can see that this is the same IOCTL as the old one this as well, QBuff, and the new ones are actually this, the request-related ones. So the request-related the request -related API are the only ones that are new. They actually operate on a different file descriptor, um, which is the media controller, instead of the video Linux typical device. And it doesn't deprecate anything because you can work with or without the request API. It's simply a way to tell the driver that, well, if the driver supports it. Of course, there are means to tell user space if the driver supports or not request API, if it has the bit set for capability for request API. And so yeah, to make, to, to make it short, no, it doesn't replicate anything. It, it actually operates on just the input side of your memory to memory device. So all decks are memory or memory devices, like I said, they have an input side and the output side, and the request API is only used on the, on, on, on the input side, because that is where you need to synchronize metadata to buffers. The output side just pops, pops encoded or decoded frames, and user space is in charge of gluing that together. With the headers, it already knows, because it is Remember that user space is in charge of doing all that header juggling. Is, is that understood? You were, you were speaking about the, the future hardware. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have ever encountered a hardware which is so different in terms of architecture so it doesn't match at all the way you are processing uh, content. Mm, no, not so far. We have seen only like, I'm, like, like I talked about, uh, two different kinds, stateful. I mean, we're talking about just the decoders or encoders here, uh, not about anything else. I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not discussing weird capture pipelines and so on, but for codecs, for video processing, uh, IP, IP blocks, um, we have the stateful variant, stateless variant, and some mixed hardware that, that Probably can be solved via request API plus something. Um, it, it's not actually future hardware. It's actually current one because it's already there on phones or tablets or Chromebooks even. Uh, it is just how mainline is going to support this. Yeah.
Yes. Uh, just just to add for what Gil was saying, one of the problems we have in Video for Linux now is uh, trying to mimic, uh, trying to be able to do as, at least what Android can. One of the things yeah. Android can is you can change uh, exposure focus uh, dynamically for every frame. Uh, so, for example, you're doing autofocus, and for every single frame you change the focus, and you want to know when you're analyzing if that frame was on focus, what focus parameters you had in that frame. And that's something we, we couldn't do because we, we didn't have that link between buffers and controls. And right now, the, all the um, Android, how they do it is they just have a blob uh, in user space that is doing this and yeah, that's not their way to do it. Uh, as, as far as I knew, and I, I don't know much about Android, but as far as I knew, there wasn't, they, they weren't using Video for Linux, right? They, no, they use Camera too. Right. They use something completely different be exactly because of this reason. They didn't have this. So one of the goals of the Request API is to provide Android with a way to, okay, guys, you can now start using Video for Linux. You don't have to roll your, your, your own. And once you have an API, that is robust enough, the, then the vendors, instead of making their own blob, they will make uh, Linux drivers. Yeah. And everybody will win. Yeah. And that is why, I guess, although it seems simple in theory, it took four years to discuss because we, we really wanted something that could last the next. Yeah. I 20, know, 1984. I know. <laughs> 20 years? I don't know if Linux is going to be around, but. I just wanted to comment on that that uh, it's sure that they won't use it if they can't. So it's better to be able to support the Android HAL uh, HAL V3, but it's not that it's not because that they're going to they're going to have the API that they're actually going to give something else than binary blobs. Some most ISP uh, image signal processor uh, vendors uh, they consider that the API is part of the IP and they don't want to expose it. That's why they give only uh, uh, user space libraries binary blobs. Particularly now with right. trouble. Okay, thank you.